problems and we yeah, have to apply it to a big server. We movie. have to know intimate details about how a, yeah. a movie was made. And that's, I think, why I keep going back to Star Wars is I know intimate details about how those dang things were made. Okay, I will try and talk more about Pixar in this Pixar episode. Yeah, we haven't been doing that in the last few. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, stop. Stand still. You're listening. Say it. Two. No, one. say you're listening. I, I'm listening. No, say you're listening. You're listening. To the worst marathon ever. To the worst marathon ever. Good job. Hey, everybody. This is Rish Outfield. And this is Big Anklevich. And you're listening to the second worst marathon. Is it ever or just this year? Ever. Oh, jeez. On uh, That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve, if, on the, the internet, on blogspot.com. On. <laughs> if you're talking about just this year, then this is easily the worst. <laughs> You have to go back several years to find the one that it's uh, only come in second place to. So our worst marathon is about the rules of Pixar storytelling. There are 22 rules that were given out by a former... No, maybe not even former. I think she was still an employee. An employee, she, she learned this stuff working at Pixar. And the last rule... Number 22. What is the essence of your story? Most economical telling of it. If you know that, you can build out from there. Now that makes me think of this uh, outlining book that I've been looking at recently. And this is also kind of something that I learned going all the way back to screenwriting class and etc., when you have an idea, they always want you to start out with just the absolute boiledest, downest possible version of it. They want you to tell your idea as one sentence. The log line? The log line. Or the premise sentence. Bah. And then you can build from there. That's something that I've been trying to do whenever I actually spend the time to do any outlining and and preparing things ahead of time is start with that sentence and then I try to expand it to like okay it's a four sentence paragraph that gives you the beginning two sentences in the middle one sentence for the end and then you expand it to four paragraphs now and then you can kind of go from there that seems pretty wise you know to to really try and understand your movie and know it so so well that you can know exactly what it's about. But it seems like you can look at one of these Pixar movies. Let's say, what's one that we haven't talked about a lot? Up. Okay, well, let's say Up. What is the logline of Up exactly? If you had to narrow it down to one sentence. Because if you narrow it down to one sentence, you lose a lot. You, I mean, if you may not include the part about the dog. You may not include the part about the balloons. You may not yeah. include... You know what I mean? If I it's think, just one sentence, what is that movie? Yeah, I think those would definitely not be included. I think the log line... It's hard to say. I don't know if this counts as a log line, because a log line is also something that you're selling the movie with. So you would want to include the balloons, at least. You know, the guy turns his home into a hot air balloon... And then flies away. That's an important... I mean, that image and that thing is what kind of sells that story. But the story is about an old man who's lost his wife. And at the same time has kind of lost his joy in life and his love for life. And through the adventure that he has with Russell, he learns... That to find joy in life again. Now, and none of that was included in the marketing of Up. No. None of that. Uh, maybe there's a grouchy old man, but they didn't say that he'd lost his... A curmudgeon? ...joie de vivre. They didn't say that he'd lost his wife. They didn't say any of that stuff because they were trying to sell it to little kids, or is it because the marketing of Pixar movies is always backwards? <laughs> but if they had 
presented it that this is this is the movie. Is it going to be a man about a man who feels like he's lost everything, and he has his eyes opened to what life is all about? Again, that feels like a pretty strong marketing hook. It's like, oh, what? an animated film that does that. I want to <laughs> see that. You know what I mean? But they would never dare. I mean, the fudge and worst one. And I, gosh, I I know I said it. 15 episodes ago, but for us, it was months ago. Finding Nemo has the worst marketing, uh, well, except for Frozen, but uh, if they had said, you know, a a father loses his son and has to go through heaven and hell to find him again or, you know, reconnect with him or whatever, it just, that would have made me much more excited to see it. And maybe it's uh, I'm not the audience that they want to get to go see it. I is are they trying to get kids to want to see it, and they force their parents to take them to it, or are they trying to get parents to say that's worth my nine fifty to take my kid to see? Yeah, I think they're going after the kids. I think they're shooting after their target market, and the kids will respond to that. But that's not going to get them to come. I don't know that they... They don't do trailers like that very often for anything. A trailer that talks about the deep message and the heart and the that stuff that's down underneath the superficial part of the story. But that's all that those Force Awakens trailers have been. That chewy, we're home thing tells you nothing about the movie. It just gives you emotion. You know what well, I mean? Yeah, but they don't need to tell you about a Star Wars movie. I guess, but it, they've made the decision, even with the final trailer, to not really tell you what it's about. To just give you what you're supposed to feel. Aren't you glad, though? I mean... Oh, you, yeah. You talked about... We were talking about it already. There's so many people already spouting their theories of, oh, yes, Jar Jar is back to avenge... Uh, Anakin, or Luke is the Dark Lord now, or et cetera, et cetera, all this stuff, everybody's spouting, and imagine how much worse it would be if they'd given us more info, how much, and worse, how much closer to the mark things might be. But most trailers are like that. They show the beginning, middle, and end (laughs) of the movie that they want you to go see, but the Pixar ones are worse because they show you the most misleading scenes that make it appear to be something that it's not. They make it appear to be a DreamWorks film. You think, oh, this is all about fart jokes. What the heck? Those aren't minions. How, how, why, why is everything acting like a minion? And yeah, I'm sorry. I got us off track. Because, yes, the Pixar marketing gurus are friggin' morons. <laughs> but... I can't be morons. Look at how much money all their movies have made. Because of word of mouth. Because they have earned it. Because people still remember how they felt the first time they saw Toy Story. And Pixar has earned our dollar. Even though they make these trailers where you're like, wow, that looks like a turd. (laughs) Well, I've still got to see it because it's a Disney Pixar movie. And I cried my eyes out when that Sarah McLachlan song played. (laughs) And you go and you're just like, oh my gosh, this is great. Honey, tell all your friends, Last Dinosaur is good, despite that terrible trailer. You know what I mean? The trailer for Last Dinosaur wasn't that bad. I haven't seen it, so, you know, just, there hasn't been a trailer. There was an asteroid and it missed, it missed. the end. Okay, so it's it's terrible. <laughs> it tells you... It's a you, teaser. Well, but there has to... By the time this plays, the movie is opening. Batman there the Dark be, Knight... Had a teaser. Wait, no, maybe it was the other Batman movie that had the teaser that was terrible. Was it Dark Knight Rises where they had all sorts of lines from the movie before? It was, wasn't it? Uh, Dark Knight was the one that just had black. Yeah, it was just all black. And you just heard voices talking. The end. That was the trailer. And everyone was like, whoa, I gotta see it. That was a year before the movie came out. (laughs) People were blown away that they were even making a sequel to that. I don't know. I maybe well, let's agree to disagree. What we can agree on is the the Pixar movies have been good despite their marketing, but there has to be a reason that they're not marketed in the 
that they don't tell you what the movie is. They okay, Inside Out. We haven't talked about that at all. Okay, because it's just too, it's too new. Yeah, it's too new. I don't um, know it well enough. But I saw that trailer today. I was in the store. And for some reason, it was on the screens that they show, you know, in the electronics department. And it was the very first trailer. And it's like, hi, I'm Joy. And we're what make you feel things. This is anger. This is disgust. And that's the whole trailer. I promise you, there's no more. And then at the end, there's like words that said, you know, the feelings that you feel. Find out why this June or whenever it came out. There was nothing to make you want to see that movie, at, 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 that I thought at least, in that trailer. But, you know, showing the, our protagonist and that she has feelings and that she's in a, a bad place and what the brain emotion beings do about it might get you, you know, oh, yeah, wow, that looks like that's something I could really get behind. Instead, they focused on all the slapstick, whatever few scenes of screaming and yelling and shouting and doing funny voices, which was basically that dinner scene where they showed what was going on in the mom's head and what this was going on in the dad's head, was what they used to make you think that it was a comedy. It, it's not a comedy. It's a dramedy. Oh, all right. Well, you lost <laughs> me. This was the worst marathon ever, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have... But... <laughs> Pulled the rug out from under you with that terrible half word. If you were paring down Inside Out into a log line, would you not mention Riley or would you not mention that? No, you would have struggling? to mention Riley for the log line. Because you could just say, is a log line something you're selling the movie with, though? Is it a well, log you line? You are the one that said that, so that's a, why I'm thinking that. Does a log line lines. count as like, it's pretty woman on a battleship? Does that count as a log line? It's Wouldn't our professor have said so? I don't know. That's what he I'm trying to clear up. That's why they all say that, because it's so easy to understand. It's Highlander meets the Matrix. Is that a log line? Does that count? Or should we... So is a log... I mean, because a premise, I think, that's what I call it in my mind. The log line thing is from distant past. I kind of ignore that. Because in my mind, there's the premise sentence, which is what the story is about. The story is about. Not how you sell the movie to get somebody to give you money to make it. Okay. And the log line is something where you can just say, yeah, it's this and this together, and it makes a great... Yeah, you want that, right? Okay, yeah, right, because the, the marketing of film never says, it's heaven is for real meets solo 12 days of Sodom. You know, it's, it's, it's never... They never do that in a movie. I mean, unless it's the trailer for uh, uh, Green Card. If you liked Pretty Woman, give Green Card a try. The, that, Did they realize they give green card a yeah, try? Yeah, it was so half They didn't say you'll love green card? It was card. just really, really limp said, that give it's give green, green card, card a try. try. Please, guys. <laughs> we know it has that ridiculously fat Frenchman in it, but... Anyhow, I, I apologize. I just can't ever unremember the green card slogan. Is that what you would call that? Sure. Anyway, uh, once again, okay. Log line for Inside Out... Not trying to sell it, not saying it's... So gosh, a even how premise we... sentence. The spine of the story. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has to be that... Joy has to basically learn that she... That there's more to helping her... What would you call the person that she lives inside of? Her owner? Her child? Yeah, her child. That's pretty good. M her child needs more than just joy to have to live a full life or something like that. Because, ba I mean, that's basically the end. The end is when she finally learns that sadness needs to have its place. She's always pushing sadness to the back, but sadness is important. You have to, you know, take the good with the bad. You take them both. And there you have the facts of life. <laughs> that's right. No, but what you just said was the perfect follow-up from that Pixar rule. Because you got the... The spine... You got the spine of the movie 
inside out, but not the cheapy little, I'm a four-year-old, this was my interpretation of the movie spine. You got like the true center of that movie, the true heart the of essence. that movie. The essence. That's the word we were that's looking the for. the word they used in the And then rule. you expand from that. Rather than, wouldn't it be funny if all a person's emotions were represented by little characters hopping around in a head, which is totally inside out, but it's a different way of going yeah, inside Yeah, and that out. might... I wouldn't be surprised if that was where the story came from. Some guy said, oh, you know what would be funny? What if we did a movie where everybody's emotions were actually, like, things? There were people or whatever. And then, of course, they built the story from there. I mean, that's their original inspiration. And I think that's a lot of the times the way a story begins, gets inspired. You're like, oh, yeah, what if this happened? But, see, that could go in any number of directions, what you just said. What they must have done was they figured out the emotional essence, the emotional core of the story they were trying to tell. And that pointed everything in a certain direction. And I think that's probably what you have to do. One Pixar movie that we've not talked about at all is Newt, because it never happened. But the premise of Newt is... That there's a male newt and a female newt, and they're the last of their species in the rainforest. And to save his species, he has to get her to fall in love with him. Now, you can find an emotional center to that, or you can find the humor in that and have it just be a broad comedy, or you can have it be Rio. But we've never sat down with, like, Gary Rydstrom or whoever is the most important person in knew to find out how they were going to tell that story but see i so wish that movie existed so that we could talk about it because i say that i say that there's a male and a female and they have he has to get her to fall in love with him to continue the species and it sounds like a movie i want to see but when i hear there are two blue birds in brazil and they're the last of their species i don't care I, why is it that i care with Newt, and I don't care with Rio. Because Newt was a Pixar movie, and Rio was not. But isn't and that just prejudice on my part, then? No, you said it before, when you were talking about the trailers. The trailers were bad, and people said, but oh, we gotta go see it, because it's a Pixar movie, and it has earned that. It has earned my trust. It has earned. I, I cried like a baby when they played the Sarah McLaughlin song. I remember how I felt when I first saw Toy Story. And so, yeah, you go to see it because you know that nine out of ten times it's going to be an amazing film. It's going to be an experience that you'll remember. That's why you care about it. And it's the same kind of thing with an author that you love. You've read this book by this author, and then you read his next book, and you liked it, and his next book, and you liked it. And so, when he puts out another one, you don't hear the story and go, hmm, that sounds like a story I might like. You just get, oh, that's by that guy? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll buy it. And you buy it, and you read it. And the reason why they've earned that uh, level of trust is because I suppose they follow all these rules that we've been going through in all of these uh, episodes. They actually do these things. These are things, not that they told her to do, but things she learned on the job. She worked at Pixar and she learned on the job all these things need to happen for a good story. And so uh, that means that they're using them. They're hard things. Not all of them, but some of them is not taking the easy way out. Some of them is like, yeah, but that's going to be way more work. And that's got to be part of the dynamic of being somebody at the Pixar Animation Studio is, well, we do that extra work. If we didn't, then we wouldn't, then people wouldn't say they, <laughs> they owed it to us to go see this movie. Regardless of how terrible the trailer was. And yeah, it's, sometimes it's really hard. On some of these that you read, I'm like, oh, geez, really? That sounds exhausting. Right. 
I don't know. Another one that I don't think we talked about at all was Monsters University. The, there, there are some really great elements in Monsters University, but there are also moments when it could have been anybody that made that movie. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. It's a good film. I like it, but I don't think it has the 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 emotional backbone that Monsters Inc. had. I might. Do you agree or disagree? It was a different emotional background, and maybe that uh, a lot of, well, I don't know. There's a fair number of Pixar movies anyways that have a parent-child dynamic. And with Monsters, Inc., you had Sully as the surrogate father to Boo, and uh, that relationship was the center of the film. And... In Monsters University, you didn't have anything like that. You just basically had Mike Wazowski trying to discover himself. I guess having that college experience. He he experimented a little in college, like we all do. And I guess their friendship coming together. But yeah, maybe, I don't know, it's hard to say. I, I was trying to think of what the essence of that film was as you were talking about it. And uh, I'm not sure. I can't. I can't name it as quickly as I did with Inside Out. I haven't seen it as recently as I have Inside Out, so maybe there's that. And it's also kind of new, so I haven't seen it as many times as I've seen a lot of the other Pixar movies because we've owned them for years and years, and my kids have watched them and rewatched them and rewatched them again. So it might be something to do with that that I just haven't seen it enough. Well, could it be? Two monsters in college who are rivals learn to work together to achieve their goals and along the way become best friends. That's one sentence. Does that encapsulate all of Monsters University? I I don't know. See, it. the thing about it is the way it ends. In the end, Mike is upset because Sully didn't really believe in him. He cheated to fake the little machine so that it would be scared by anything that he did he set it back down to bedwetter (laughs) and uh and just going boo makes it go all the way to the top and so he goes breaks into the door and goes into the human world to prove that he's scary and discovers that in fact he is not and Sully goes in to save him, and they manage to work together to scare even the adults using Mike's knowledge and Sully's talent, raw ability, I don't know what you want to call it, and that gets them back out. So <laughs> the worst thing is when I when I think about that... <laughs> The message that I want to say is everybody needs to learn their place (laughs) because that's it it seems like. But that's what Mike learns. Half of what the message is that Mike learns. He learns he's not scary. He can't be what he wants to be. He can't live his dreams, which what the hell kind of a message is that? But I remember when we saw that movie, when we saw it, we talked about that. It's like, what a subversive lesson that everybody needs to learn as they grow up is just today a person was saying oh it's such a shame that we don't live in a world where kids think that everything that they do is perfect that they won't think that forever and eventually they they'll discover that people don't like the smell of their own poop and i was just like we all have to learn that yes that is an important part of growing up is your dreams will get blocked lots of times and there's no way to achieve it, that you have to continue to live to say, okay, what, what, what else do I want? What can I get? What's second best? What's third best? What's Okay, now I'm depressing myself. Maybe that's not the message, though. Maybe the message is everyone has something that they are amazing at, and you just need to learn what it is so that you can share that talent with the world because Mike is just as amazing as Sully, at least in this movie. I mean, in the, the first movie, he doesn't seem that way. It doesn't seem like Sully is basically 
riding on Mike's knowledge, and maybe things have changed over the years, but in the Monsters University, Mike learns that he is the one that knows how to scare people. I mean, he's the, the brains of the outfit, whereas Sully is the brawn. And both are necessary. And that's one of those things, you know, every time Sully's just like, oh, I don't need to know that stuff. I'm just scary. Roar! And he roars out and the dean says, oh, now you've made this child cry. And her parents will come in and discover the monster world and ruin everything. So Sully is inadequate by himself. And, uh, you know, he has a gift of being scary. But he needs the other half of his gift is the rest of his team to really make it work <sighs> although I mean that, that does seem kind of like what they discover at the end I don't know if that's the essence of the film or not it's hard to say but yeah I don't know that they're telling you <laughs> find your place and stay in it is, that's where your words went. <laughs> I know, and that's why I was uh, I was thinking, gosh, that can't really be the message of the film. Maybe it is, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, when it's done, you don't think Mike is lesser than Sully. <sighs> I guess they both got expelled <laughs> in the end. Yeah, they get expelled, and they find another place in which they can shine, which I, I think is kind of brilliant in that movie. I, I loved that they both got kicked out of school. It wasn't super predictable. I, you know, it wasn't the easy solution to the story. What, Yeah, what they earned was getting kicked out by cheating, you know what I mean? And they didn't cop out and just say, well, the dean looked the other way. Uh-huh. And at the end of Monsters, Inc., Mike becomes the star. Now, granted, it's just you played for laughs in one tiny little scene, but their roles are reversed. And if they ever made a, a second Monsters, Inc., what is Sully's place in this world where they harness laughter? Yeah, he's just the Does guy Sully that just hauls around with the Luke? cans now, sets them up for Mike. He's the one that's moving them in and out real quick as they fill up. Yep, yep, yep. Slumber party. <laughs> it's a good movie. All right, well, we've gone through 22 painful hours. <laughs> Um, I, I really love the Pixar animation studio and, and yeah, I will continue to go to their movies. I can't wait for the good dinosaur. I hope it's still in the future when you're hearing this, but, uh, yeah, I don't even need to know any more about it except for the bare premise and that it's Pixar to know that I will go to it. I don't know. You seem to know more about Good Dinosaur than I do. Do I? Well, because you... I know very little. I did see that teaser trailer that you said was terrible. Well, it just shows a comet, right? And it misses the Earth. Well, they show it hit the Earth, and then they say, well, "But what if?" I wonder how they're going to do that in the film. Are they going to even do that? What if the comet didn't hit the Earth? Or are they just going to be like, "Here it is, modern day, and look, there's a dinosaur." What would the world be like if there was dinosaurs? That's an exercise in world building. Would we have cars or would we just ride around on dinosaurs? Would we run from dinosaurs all the time? I mean, in this one, it's a pet dinosaur. I don't know. I mean, we are so good at killing things that if human beings and dinosaurs existed at the same time, I think we would have slaughtered them all. Or at least subjugated them all. I mean, like we've done with all the other animals. I mean, elephants... We ride around in, I mean, places where there are elephants. They actually use them for transportation and for muscle. Okay, well, like, yeah, brachiosaurs or patasauruses or whatever, yes. But the ones that are higher than us on the food chain, we would have eliminated, is what I think. Possible, or at least gotten them down to a... Uh, you yes, know, the, like lions or something. There would be only in there little, would be zoos and yeah. T Rexes and uh, Allosauruses in them and Velociraptors, but no other places. They're only out on the uh, the Serengeti. The Serengeti, place. where there's no one around to be hunted by them. Yes, yeah, so and people go out. Multi-millionaires and dentists yeah. go out there to shoot the the few remaining Velociraptors. But I don't think. Good Dinosaur is modern day, is it? 
I thought that the humans were cavemen. Oh, are they? I did not know. I, I thought it was modern day. I guess we'll find out. I guess so. See, I don't think that they would need to do this whole what if the comet didn't hit the Earth to do a story about cavemen and dinosaurs. They've kind of already done that. I mean, they already did the crudes. Yeah. They already did uh, Ice Age. I'm sure there had to be some Ice Age that had people in it. Yeah. I didn't see anywhere past the first one. I don't think there were people in that one, but maybe there were. I don't know. I've forgotten. I, I, I blocked it all out. But yeah, I, I, I would. There was one where the whole premise is they find a human cub, you know, a baby. Uh, and they've just, got a I think that's the first one. Really? You're right. I think I saw that one. So yeah, I don't think they would need to do that for that. So I, that's why I think it's modern day thing. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited for it too. I think it'll be cool. It's sad. I'm 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 to the point where I fear every time a Pixar movie comes out, instead of just rejoice, I fear that it's going to be the one where I'm just like, oh, really? That's all. Yeah. I, I fear the Pixar is going to come out with I don't know an Ice Age, a Minions, something not inspired, a, a Madagascar, a I'm trying to think of good overall example of the, the what could go wrong and I think it's probably just because I didn't like Cars 2 very much I felt Cars 2 was really lacking and I'm afraid they're gonna especially considering how much they've gone over to the sequel thing that they're gonna fall into that so far all their sequels have been good we just talked about Monsters University and all both of the Toy Story sequels were good so I, the only one is Cars 2 that wasn't amazing. And Good Dinosaur is not even a sequel, so I, again, should not be worried. For some reason, I always am. And maybe it's just because, I don't know, I'm a fatalist. I'm not, I'm not an optimist. I don't presume the, the best is going to happen. Instead, I presume the worst. And then maybe I'm pleasantly surprised or something. I don't know. But Well, we, you, you're a gambler. And you've won the last ten hands in a row, but you're not allowed to leave the table. <laughs> so each time you're dealt cards, you're like, uh-oh. Okay, this is going to be the one. And you know, it's like, what? Two queens and two kings? Well, I got two pair already. Uh, but I don't think Good Dinosaur is modern day, is it? I thought that the humans were cavemen. Oh, are they? I did not know. I, I thought it was modern day. I guess we'll find out. I guess so. See, I don't think that they would need to do this whole what if the comet didn't hit the earth to do a story about cavemen and dinosaurs. They've kind of already done that. I mean, they already did the crudes. Yeah. They already did uh, Ice Age. I'm sure there had to be some Ice Age that had people in it. Yeah. I didn't see anywhere past the first one. I don't think there were people in that one, but maybe there were. I don't know. I've forgotten. I, I, I blocked it all out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would. There was one where the whole premise is they find a human cub, you know, a baby. Uh, and they've just, got a I think that's the first one. Really? You're right. I think I saw that one. Um, anyways. So yeah, I don't think they would need to do that for that. So I, that's why I think it's modern day okay thing anyways yeah i'm excited for it too i think it'll be cool uh it's sad i'm 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 to the point where i fear every time a pixar movie comes out instead of just rejoice i fear that it's going to be the one where i'm just like oh really that's all yeah I, I fear the pixar is going to come out with a I don't know, an Ice Age, a Minions, uh, something not inspired, a, a Madagascar, a, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the ones that I dislike, that's a good overall example of the, the what could go wrong and I think it's probably just because I didn't like Cars 2 very much 
thought Cars 2 was really lacking. I'm afraid they're going to, especially considering how much they've gone over to the sequel thing, that they're going to fall into that. So far, all their sequels have been good. We just talked about Monsters University, and all both of the Toy Story sequels were good. So I, the only one is Cars 2 that wasn't amazing. And Good Dinosaur is not even a sequel, so I, again, should not be worried. For some reason, I always am. And maybe it's just because, I don't know, I'm a fatalist. I'm not, I don't have, I'm not an optimist. I don't presume the, the best is going to happen. Instead, I presume the worst. And then maybe I'm pleasantly surprised or something. I don't know, but... Well, we, you, you're a gambler. And you've won the last ten <laughs> hands in a row, uh, and but you're not allowed to leave the table. <laughs> so each time you're dealt cards, you're like, uh oh, okay, this is going to be the one. And you know, it's like, what? Two queens and two king? Well, I got two pair already. The two pair already. Uh, that that one was brave. I don't know. I was trying to think of one that nobody ever talks about. That's really good. Brave was really good. I've just haven't seen it in so long. Oh, okay, well, on that note, give me your three favorite Pixar movies. Ne go. <sighs> okay, well, number one is pretty definitely Finding Nemo. I want to say number two is probably Wally. -E. And number three... It's really hard to narrow it down to just three is the real problem. I feel if when I pick one that I'm being t unfair to the ones that I leave off the list. Probably, I guess I'd have to say Toy Story is number Damn it. three. I can't believe it. I was going to say Finding Nemo Wally is Toy Story. I okay. can't believe you did that. Although it could be lying. I could love Cars 2, Bug's Life, and uh, Ratatouille best. But no, yeah, I... I the, the third one was the hardest because I was like, oh, shoot, do I pick up? I love up. Should I pick Incredibles? I, I, oh, Incredibles is really good. But Toy Story, uh, it's just, it was the first one and I, I love that so much. It just blew me away. So, so mine are Finding Nemo, Wally, -E, and Toy Story, too. That's funny. Not two as in oh, right, number also. two, but also, yeah, thank you. That's funny. That sucks, man. What a, boring life we have <laughs> it's like the, the old married couple where it's like you want some of my meat we ordered the same thing oh it took me forever to pick a number three because yeah it's really hard to i feel yeah i don't feel disloyal like incredibles monsters inc yeah monsters inc up they have so many really good movies that it's hard to just do a top three but I figured I had to say Toy Story because I love it. And I've seen it probably more than any of the others. I love Toy Story 3 also, but because it's a sequel, I automatically sort of discount it. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, the, the emotional level in Toy Story 3 is way beyond the emotional level of Toy Story 1. Uh-huh. But yet, Toy Story 1 is the one I go back to. Yeah. Maybe uh, you always remember your first. Mm, I hear you. <laughs> and B movie. Gosh, I can't believe we oh, haven't talked about the B movie you better, on this. You whole better stop that thing right now. Because <laughs> just stop. Just don't. The casting of Jerry Seinfeld was just, just... don't. <laughs> we said years and years and years ago on the Dune Steve, before there was a That Gets My Goat, that one of the things we most hated was people that misidentified non-Pixar movies as Pixar movies. Yeah, people that just assumed... Basically, like, in their mind, a computer animated equals Pixar. Yeah, that's... that's, that's like, it's, that's a, like word it's a... Like, it's a... It's the adjective that describes it. Oh, yeah. When you hear some of those just turds being called Pixar movies, it's upsetting. Yeah, Hoodwinked wasn't one of the better Pixar movies. <laughs> Sorry, Hoodwinked wasn't one of the better anything. Yeah. You know what's sad? You know how I have like a big Pez dispenser collection? Uh-huh. But um, 
there's just certain things. I mean, there's there's Pez dispensers out there available that I don't have. And it's basically because, yeah, I took a stand. I'm not going to buy Hello just Kitty. everything. I wouldn't buy Hello Kitty. On top of that, though, there are B-movie Pez dispensers. <laughs> Why? I know what to get you for your... Why is there, there B-movie Pez dispensers? Why, who would want that? Why would someone spend money on it? I'm sure that movie made money. I never saw it, but it was on today. The kids were watching it. I wasn't watching it, but I just heard Jerry Seinfeld voices. And I'd look and I was like, what the heck? Oh, it's B-movie. And you know what that is? It's ants with a Z, but with Bs. <laughs> where he's just like, no, I don't want to be a drone. I want to ding my auntie, no pass. <laughs> I was just like, wait, that's what Ants was. He didn't want to be a drone. Oh, he wanted to think outside the box. He wanted the trying to... again. But you know what that also is? It's a bug's life, but with bees. I disagree. <laughs> because the whole grasshopper thing. Flick. Did not want to just... He wouldn't just be a regular old drone. He wouldn't just get in line. He had to do his own thing and invent stuff. But there were circus bugs in Bugs Life. That's true. You know what else there is? Penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> Pez dispenser. F you. <laughs> and F the penguins of Madagascar. Uh, a friend of ours was... The showrunner, I think, was it? Was he the creator for the goddamn Penguins of Madagascar show? I don't know. You know, sometimes I think about how my career took a, a left turn and his took a right. And that has made all the difference, kids. But the, I don't know that I would trade all my years of solitude and misery and poverty to work on Penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> I just, I kill. What, what, tell me your feelings I, about the penguins. I despise them not quite as much as I despise minions. You despise minions more. Oh yes. Oh, see, I think minions have a little charm to them, whereas penguins has nothing. Okay, but penguins are not every <laughs> damn where. <laughs> That's true. Any minions Facebook case you, post you, today. You can't do anything. Are. You can't wipe your butt without looking down and be like, oh, crap, it's minion-themed toilet paper. If they weren't so everywhere, I probably would think they were cute, not despise them. But they have gone so far beyond. And I think it's just, yeah, it's just basically Facebook. Just the way they've just put a minion on anything. It's like a quote from the Bible and then it has a minion standing there in its stupid little blue overalls. Or it's a uh, yeah, it hang in there baby Friday's coming and it's a minion. <laughs> or you know it's a uh, whatever the opposite of a quote from the Bible and then there's a minion. You know it just how a minion applies to everything in the freaking world I don't know. Yeah it's like what it takes for evil to triumph is good men to do nothing and there's a picture of a minion there. <laughs> Wait, what? Some minion wearing like a suit of armor. And you're like, oh, yeah. Uh. So there. Well, we ended this episode on a dark note, didn't we, kids? <laughs> I just, I wanted to talk about the three favorite Pixar movies. And we ended up talking. At least we didn't bring up Dougal. It, let, let's end on Dougal. Do you remember what you said? Dougal was for who who you said Dougal was for I do not okay my friend Big Ankovich said there's this movie Dougal basically Dougal is a movie that you buy if you don't give a crap about your kids <laughs> you buy for the child you hate you really don't love your children so you buy them Dougal <laughs> That stuck with me forever because it was when I first moved out here and I was living with my uncle and he had bought a copy of Dougal for his kid. <laughs> uh, I couldn't have said that. That's too humorous. Um, <laughs> if you're just indifferent to your child, then you buy them Bolt. Wait, which one was Bolt? That was the Disney one that had Miley Cyrus as the voice of like the kid in it and... Uh, I, the dog was like on a TV show. And it thought that the TV show was real. Yeah. They didn't realize that all the people around it were acting. It thought it was a super dog. Mm-hmm. You buy your children that if you're like, I 
I'm, I'm okay with my kid. I don't love him, but I'm okay. Is that? But I'm, I'm not angry or, <clears throat> you know, I don't have any malice toward him. Yeah, at I, least. I wouldn't want him to pass away. I'm just indifferent. So, okay. <laughs> but if you love your children, buy them Pixar. All right, we're gonna end on that, folks. Thanks. I'm pointing at the microphone. It's you. <laughs> That's right, to infinity and beyond. Thank you for listening to all of these hours of us rattling our jaws. Boy, are there any listeners left? I don't know. After I ranted about minions, I, I think Justin Charles has quit, too. Oh! Holy cow, that's one of the signs of the apocalypse, folks. Yeah. I think he likes minions a lot. Everyone on Facebook likes minions a lot. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening, everybody. It's been the second worst marathon ever, but, you know, at least it wasn't the worst. So there's that. The, yes, that's the end. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donated. I was going to say Finding Nemo up Toy Story. I okay. Can... You said up as number two, by the way. What did I say? Up. You said no, up not as up Wally, two. Sully. Wally is this number two. Right? Oh, okay. So your list is exactly, exactly the same, the same as, as yours. Yes. Okay. Because you said up as number two, and then you said, I couldn't decide number three. I thought maybe up and maybe, and I was like, wait a minute. I think you may have misspoken there. I did. So do I have to do it over again? Or? Sure. Go ahead.